Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bank Street. I'm Jenny Brown, director of the Center for Children's Literature here at Bank Street College of Education. Welcome to the 43rd annual Irma Simonton and James H. Black Award presentation and the fourth annual Cook Prize presentation. It is my honor to introduce our new president, the president of Bank Street College of Education, Shale Polacco Saransky. Please help me welcome. Good morning, I'm Shea Palako Saransky, president of Bank Street College of Education. Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the 43rd anniversary of the Irma Simonton Award and James H. Black Award. Um, and it's the fourth annual um, Cook Prize, which was established in honor of uh, picture books that represent the best in STEM principles. So I'm really delighted to welcome you all here today. This is also a special year for us because we're approaching our centennial uh, in 2016, and so we're preparing to celebrate in many ways and hope that you'll be able to join us as we engage in that. Um, these awards really are exemplary um, as part of Bank Street's history and have shaped a lot of our work. Um, so I wanted to just tell you a little bit about how these awards were chosen. The Irma Simonton Black Award is chosen by children um, as the best read aloud picture book for first and second graders. Irma Black famously poked fun at the criteria for the Caldecott Medal. She wondered, how can you choose the most distinguished American picture book for children without considering the words and the pictures together? She was a longtime leader and member of the Bank Street Writers Lab and close friend to Maurice Sendak, who designed the seal for this award. She listened to children and valued the way words and pictures work together to reach a child socially and emotionally. Michael Cook and Don Cook were not related. However, they were united in the way that they taught and influenced generations of students in the School for Children and the Graduate School. Michael Cook was the math science coordinator in the Bank Street School for Children for more than 40 years. Don Cook taught in Bank Street's graduate school for more than 30 years. Each time the Cook Prize has been awarded, a jury composed of two graduate faculty, two School for Children teachers, and two distinguished alumni gather to consider the best of the STEM titles for third and fourth graders. Through the selection process, the jurors, most of whom studied or worked alongside Michael or Don, shared stories about them and what they would have enjoyed about the books under consideration. Through these awards, the legacies of the people who inspired them live on through the people that they taught and the ideas they inspired. We're delighted to have their families with us today. Today, we celebrate and say thank you. Thank you to Irma Black's family, Connie and Earl, and their son Douglas, who are here today for making this day possible and for your continued support. We also thank the families of, the, of Don Cook and Michael Cook. And thank you to Bank Street's Children's Book Committee, who read and evaluated hundreds of picture books over the course of the year and narrowed down the field of titles that met the criteria for these awards. Thank you to the Irma Black Jury and the Cook Prize Jury for identifying the top candidates for children to consider and select. And thank you to the School for Children teachers who integrated the award into their curriculum. Thank you to School Library Journal for getting the word out so that so many schools across the world could collaborate. And thank you to Kid Lit TV who's televising this ceremony live um, for many classrooms around the country who were involved in the voting so that they can tune in and watch their favorite authors and artists accept the honors. And thank you to the publishers for their submissions and for the continued commitment to the so the picture book is an outstanding literary form for learning. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Alexis Wright, who's our Dean of Children's Programs, who has, is he, is he, yeah, there he is. Come on down, Alexis. Thank you, and welcome. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Alexis Wright, Dean of Children's Programs. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for, for coming. 
Uh, thanks, Shale, for those remarks. And then also just to sort of reiterate some of the same points as Shale about the importance of the Irma Black Awards and Cook Prize uh, to our school's curriculum. So with the Irma Black Award and the Cook Prize now in its fourth year, we as educators get to witness an ever-changing pool of titles, uh, but also a really rich and consistent curriculum for children to evaluate the text and the artwork. And we really get a sense of how the text and the artwork mesh together to make a successful read aloud experience. So the work begins in the Bank Street classrooms with the teachers partnering with Allie Bruce, who is our children's librarian. Uh, to support this curriculum of critical book evaluation. So in the library in the classroom, we ask the children to think analytically about the books. Uh, their discussions are across disciplines and in many ways very reflective of our curriculum here in the school. Children will be hearing aloud uh, an information book about the process by which a tortoise evolves because of its environment. What happens when two guys set out to dig a hole? Uh, or why sometimes the youngest in the crowd comes up with the best idea. And then the assistant teachers in the classrooms also help with the conversation and the work, and they can use that to inform their, their work in the graduate school, in their graduate classes. To get to the four finalists of the Irma Black Awards, we ask our eight, nine, and 10-year-old students to look critically at the art and words of 16 finalists chosen by the group of, of educators, librarians, and the children's book committee members. What makes this book the best? What makes it juicy? Uh, what are the juicy words? How's the story engaging? Uh, can and how do the children relate to, to the stories? And so over the course of five weeks, the children read, discuss, and advocate for their favorites. Then they vote, and I think that's one of the more special components of, of this work, where the children are the uh, arbiters of the finalists. And then next, the children in the first and second grade classrooms read, examine, discuss, and reread those books over a four-week period before they vote on the winning book from the selection of finalists. And uh, my oldest daughter is here in the first grade, so I have to say it's pretty exciting as the, a dad and as the dean uh, to hear about her excitement and the excitement in the classroom uh, over the process. Uh, with regard to the Cook Prize, because uh, again, as Shell mentioned, we are looking for the most accurate as well as engaging books that teach STEM, STEM principles, we ask our team of the six experts, the two teachers in the School for Children, graduate faculty, and distinguished alums to narrow down that field to four uh, finalists. Uh, and then the students with their Irma Black experience sort of fresh in their minds get to engage in those conversations and then vote on their favorite Cook Prize. Uh, uh, candidate. And, and we're also very proud that the curriculum guides for these two um, uh, processes are available on our website for, for others to take advantage of. So in closing, I'd like to uh, uh, again thank all the publishers who submitted books uh, and who support the work of the Children's Book Committee, uh, as well as the classrooms here at Bank Street, all the teachers involved, and all of you for being here. So I'd like to bring back Jenny Brown uh, to the podium. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Fiona Robinson comes to us from Brooklyn, New York by way of Northern England. Her work has been honored by the Royal Academy of Arts in London and her favorite things include drawing, reading, drinking tea, and telling her stories to children. She often reads newspapers and magazines back to front. When she was in elementary school, her teachers called her Little Leonardo. Fiona Robinson won the 2012 Irma Simonton and James H. Black Award for her book, What Animals Really Like. We wanted to share some highlights from the discussion among the children for her book, recorded in School Library Journal by Lisa Von Drasik. Children notice that the conductor thinks he knows what animals like. How is he wrong? Has anyone ever thought they knew what you liked best? Were they right or wrong? How did they let how did you let them know what you really like? What do you notice about the pictures? One child responded, I noticed that in the beginning, the animals weren't happy. How do you know? Their faces are serious and not happy. In the end, they are happy and jumping up and down all over the page when they are doing what they really like. Fiona Robinson claims she doesn't like loud noises or clapping, but Fiona? We think we know what you'd really like, so we're going to clap and make loud noises anyway. Please help me welcome Fiona Robinson. Oh. 
any, any fool could do it, okay. So, hi everyone. It's been three years since I won the Irma Black Award for my book, What Animals Really Like, a story about a choir of animals rebelling against their conductor. And I think the most satisfying part of the award is that it is voted for by children. Children are notoriously honest, so you really know with this award that to be an honoree or win is a true marker of your book's success. By coincidence this year, my son took part in the award voting. Gabriel and his friends were extremely thorough and had some tough decisions to make. The librarians helping them choose, Chris Rush and Megan Kilgallen at Packer, very kindly shared the following comments all made by the kids. My favorite books were Blizzard and Elizabeth Queen of the Seas because they were based on true stories. I loved Blizzard because I love snow days. It was hard to decide. It was complicated to think about all of the books. They were all good. I had to read them over again before I decided. It was hard, but the reason I chose Elizabeth Queen of the Seas was it was, well, obviously interesting and a good story, but I liked how Elizabeth was trying to be human almost. She had human feelings. Elizabeth Queen of the Seas was just cool. Elizabeth reminds me of my dog. <laughs> <clears throat> Shh, we have a plan, it's just so funny. And I love the illustrations too. They look like collages and collage is my favorite art technique. I really liked Sam and Dave dig a big hole. It was really funny that they couldn't see the huge diamond was right near them. I've read many books by John Clausen. I have two books by him. I eliminated the books I didn't like. I chose Sam and Dave Dig a Big Hole because it was really funny and I thought the illustrations were the best. And finally, I also liked Sam and Dave Dig a Big Hole, but I didn't vote for them because they've already won a big award and have a sticker. <laughs> and I would personally like to congratulate all the honorees and the winners of the Irma Black Award and the Cook Prize for their great books. People outside this business think it's pretty easy to have an idea, get a friend to illustrate it, and hey presto, come up with a great book for kids. As many here know, it's more often a labor of love, something we dreamed about when we were kids ourselves. Now, I'd just like to touch a little on my creative process and share with you how I come up with ideas and create a final illustration. I've realized recently that I'm drawn to write about characters who rebel against the role they've been given. For what animals really like, I remember listening to an NPR story about the Thai National Elephant Orchestra. In Thailand, the cessation of logging meant there were many industrious elephants suddenly at a loose end. Rather than letting them slack off in shopping malls, the Thais taught them how to drum. They turned out to be such good drummers, they became an orchestra. Anyway, the night I heard the NPR story, I had a dream. In it, the elephants were playing the drums, dressed in tuxedos on the stage. Yes, I do have dreams like that. <laughs> um, then they stopped and complained. They all wanted to play the triangle instead. I woke up and immediately set to work, and I wondered what if all the different animals in a choir disagreed with the role they'd been given? What if... Oh, what happened then? Oh, there we go. Oh. What if wolves didn't like howling and preferred to perform magic? What if pigeon likes, pigeons like ballet? What if shrimp like to ski? And what if, instead of swimming, frogs like tennis and most martial arts? And pizza with extra mushrooms, but with absolutely no tomatoes whatsoever. That is a story in its essence. Much of the humor comes from the animal's non-stereotypical likes and their grumpy conductor who struggles with their rebellious behavior. My subsequent story, Whale Shines, featured a whale who's in advertising, which is getting him down, and who'd much pr prefer to be a painter. Then I illustrated an Eva Ibbotson story, The Abominables, about a peaceful group of yetis on a road trip. In this case, the abominables are human beings. 
The story I'm working on at the moment is also about fighting expectations. It's a biography about Ada Lovelace, who was not a 1970s porn star, <laughs> <clears throat> but the world's first computer programmer. It contains some great words and great names like Charles Babbage, Lord Byron, Algorithm, Difference Engine, and Analytical Engine. Ada was the daughter of Lord Byron and was a member of the aristocracy. She was supposed to grow up to be a lady, marry well, and have children. But my story focuses on how, in a male-dominated world, she uses her imagination and enormous math skill to come up with an algorithm for Charles Babbage's analytical engine, said to be the world's first computer. Now, I've not written nonfiction before, so I was a little hesitant, and especially with the subject matter being about math and computing. Math is a subject that I've always struggled with. I thought to myself, how can I explain to children what an algorithm is when I have no idea myself? <laughs> but then I realized I might be up to the task. It was an advantage to know so little. Whatever I could understand, an eight-year-old could. And maybe a book about a mathematician who was practically a princess might help girls to look at math with more enthusiasm than I did. Anyway, I hadn't quite realized that writing and illustrating nonfiction would be so engrossing or have so many pitfalls. Here's a case in point. Okay, so here's a series of pictures of Lord Byron. And I don't know if you can notice this, but um, actually on the left, his eyes are brown and on the right, his eyes are blue. And this is a picture of Ada Lovelace, and on the left her eyes are kind of brown, and on the right her eyes are kind of grey. So, when I did these initial sketches of them, I'd originally given them brown eyes, and then I was thinking, God, I, you know, how, what on earth is the colour of their eyes? It's just ridiculous. So I had to do a lot more research, and I found that actually they both had steely grey-blue eyes. And I was quite relieved because then I suddenly realized that if information surfaces to show they both have irrefutably brown eyes, at least like blue is an easier color to change into brown than vice versa. <laughs> so I'd just like to end by showing a couple of illustrations already completed for the book Ada's Ideas. When I illustrated what animals really like, I played with the idea of creating 3D images like a Victorian toy theater, which would then be photographed for the book. And this is, this is my editor with one of the models I made at, the point, at that point. Because of time restraints, this technique wasn't possible. But with this new project and Ada's life being seeming so theatrical, I thought I would give it a try. So here's the first illustration I completed. It's Ada as a 12-year-old. She was obsessed with trying to invent a winged, steam-powered horse, and she called her ideas flyology. So for the second image, which is about Ada's fascination with the Industrial Revolution, I took a trip to the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester, England, where I'm from. Um, the power hall there contains all sorts of fantastic steam engines and all their bits and bobs, um, which were perfect for this illustration, so I photographed them last summer. Now, this is what I would usually show my editor. Um, it's part of the dummy of the book, and it just roughly maps out where the illustration is going to go and where the um, text is going to go, which is really important at this stage. Then I do a few further very rough sketches, and then I focus on one. And then, when I'm kind of happy with that composition, I... I've, because I'm using a technique where I actually cut out individual images, I can draw Ada by herself and then add some tone. And you notice I can go on over, over the lines on this because um, it will be cut out eventually. And then I add some color and then I cut her out. Ah, now the background for this image is actually made by putting a wash of black watercolour across the paper. And while it's wet, you add piles of salt in kind of roundish shapes. And as it dries, the salt soaks up all the colour. So where the salt's been, it leaves white patches. And it gives this nice kind of smoky, <clears throat> excuse me, steamy effect. 
And then, as this is three-dimensional, to give it consistency, I'm actually attaching the images using my son's Lego, <laughs> which he actually doesn't know about, so I'm doing it really sneakily. Um, so that gives it a consistency throughout the book. And then I try, I try out where Ada goes, and then that's the final illustration. So finally, I'd just like to thank everyone at Bank Street for inviting me to speak. It's been an honor, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Fiona. I love that salt rubbing technique. We'll have to try that. It is now my pleasure to bring to the podium two distinguished colleagues who will present the Irma Simonton and James H. Black Award and Honors. Allie Bruce, children's librarian here at Bank Street College and the School for Children, and a member of the Bank Street Children's Book Committee. And Molly Welsh Kruger, member of the Bank Street Graduate Faculty, specializing in children's literature and literacy, and co-chair of the Bank Street Children's Book Committee. Please help me welcome them. Uh, thank you, Fiona, for bringing us into the process. Now we prepare to celebrate the work of the illustrators and authors represented for the Irma, Irma Black Award. Sorry. Um, just to begin, uh, all of these books are books that are also listed as part of the Bank Street Children's Book Committee Best Books of the Year. You can get your own copy out at the table. Um, but we also provide this information online for folks who are interested in finding really great books, like the ones we're celebrating today. So we're going to start um, with honoring our three Irma Black Award honor books. And that first honor book for the 2015 Irma Simonton and James H. Black Award goes to Blizzard, written and illustrated by John Bosco, published by Hyperion, Books for Children, which is an imprint of Disney Book Group. Uh, here's our quote, blurb. Snowed in for days, a young boy devises a way to get to the store for supplies for his family and his neighbors, illustrated with pencil, watercolor, and digital paintings. John Roscoe, please come on down and receive your Irma Black Award. Thank you, Allie. <laughs> Come on up. Okay. Say congratulations. Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is amazing. I, um, I'm very thrilled to be here uh, for this and to be honored among these other incredible books that um, I've seen over the course of their building and their publication and I've seen galleys and all along the way I keep thinking to myself John you better step it up because <laughs> um, you know I've had the privilege of watching Brian work we shared a studio for a long time and and he's always <clears throat> making me want to be a better uh, author illustrator and uh, and I know Mac I've told you many a times how much I loved Sam and Dave. So, and you know, I don't have to say anything nice about Chris because he's not here. Um, but his his graphic approach is just second to none. It's beautiful. Um, so to have my book sitting in that midst is really uh, quite an honor. I'm thrilled, and it, it was a um, it was an interesting journey. I don't, I don't know how much I can talk here. But, um, <clears throat> Okay, so the, <laughs> the story itself was something that uh, I had been telling my daughter for a very long time because uh, she, <clears throat> part of her bedtime ritual was that she would have three books read to her and then I was to tell her a story from my childhood. And uh, it always was, Daddy, tell me a story about when you were little. And so I told her many stories about when I was little. I was a latchkey kid 
Um, and so we, my sister and I, would come home from school and pretty much be on our own for the, the remainder of the day. Um, and I would be doing everything from, uh, you know, going fishing at the end of the street to making napalm in the garage, you know. Uh, and, and so an adventure like this one um, was something I wouldn't think twice about. Um, and that's what happened uh, during the blizzard of 1978. We were snowed in for nine days and uh, running out of food and, and milk and eggs and all the things that we wanted. So um, it, it didn't really cross my mind to like not do it, you know, which was to strap on these tennis rackets and march off to the store with my sled. And it, for me, it kind of saddens me that kids can't have those kind of adventures nowadays. It's like my daughter can go from one tree to another tree uh, on the sidewalk as long as we're in the front yard, you know. And, and it's, it's, it's a different world we live in. So I think it's our responsibility to at least tell these stories so that they can have that adventure vicariously through a book. And um, I am so happy again for this. I want to thank not only Bank Street, but the, the award itself, the Irma Black Award, and uh, to my publishers, uh, Disney Hyperion, Stephanie, my editor, my art director, Joanne, publicist, Dina, thank you. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Our second honor goes to Elizabeth, Queen of the Seas by Lynn Cox, illustrated by Brian Floca. Published by Schwartz and Wade in imprint of Random House Children's Books. An elephant seal finds a home on the Avon River in a New Zealand town. Based on a true story and illustrated in pen and ink watercolor and includes a great photograph of Elizabeth. Lynn Cox could not be with us today, but we are delighted to welcome Brian Floca to accept his Irma Black Honor Award as illustrator of Elizabeth, Queen of the Seas. I also want to point out, Brian Floca created the Cook Prize seal that appears on all of our Cook Prize finalist books. So please help us welcome Brian to the stage. Hi, how are you? <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'm here for two seals, that's nice. Uh, thank you, Bank Street, and thank you, Jenny Brown, and everyone on the committee, and thank you, thank you kids of America. Um, I'm very happy that Elizabeth, Queen of the Seas, is a finalist for the 2015 Irma Black Award. Um, I'm very happy to be in the company of the fellow nominees. Uh, and the fantastic winner and in the company of so many people who care so much about children's books. John has already touched on, on how good it was to share a, a studio together. I do want to say I've seen a rough draft of the Napalm book and I think you're all going to really like it. So. <laughs> um, I want to thank Lynn Cox for putting this delightful character to the page and thank Lynn and everyone at Schwartz and Wade for giving me a chance to work with the story and for all the insight and the help they provided with illustrating the story. Um, if you're used to writing and illustrating your own stories, you're used to finding a topic that you already know interests you and, and diving into that and exploring it. One of the great things about illustrating the story that someone else has written is that it's a chance to get presented with and introduced to something you didn't know you would care about. Uh, the chance to learn about something like that and explore it. And Elizabeth was a chance for me to learn about southern elephant seals. One thing I learned is that of all the elephant seals out there, I'm glad we chose to focus on Elizabeth. In the course of my Googling, I also discovered another elephant seal in New Zealand named Homer, who comes ashore not to take lovely, peaceful naps, but to uh, challenge Volkswagens and small pickup trucks for territorial rights. I don't know how that would have worked as a picture book. That might have worked. Maybe there's a sequel there. Uh, but Elizabeth, uh, instead of challenging Toyota, shows us something about faithfulness, friendship, and home. And it was a pleasure. It was, a, it was a moving experience to read that story before there was any image that, uh, that went with it. And so I really feel grateful and happy that I had the chance to, to try to illustrate that story and provide the pictures for it. And um, 
Thanks again to Bank Street and the kids and to all of you for being here. Thank you. And our third honor book goes to Shh, We Have a Plan, written and illustrated by Chris Houghton and published by Candlewick Press. Our blurb, three hunters are outwitted by a child and a bird in this practically wordless story. Brilliantly colored digital illustrations enhance the humor. Chris, unfortunately, could not be here with us today, but he did send along a videotaped message for us to share with all of you. Thanks, Jenny. My name is Chris Walton. I'm the author and illustrator of Shh, We Have a Plan. Yeah, I'd just like to thank um, everyone from the Irma Black Award. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> Good to see you. My name is Chris Walton. I'm the author and illustrator of Shh, We Have a Plan. Yeah, I'd just like to thank um, everyone from the Irma Black Award. I'd uh, an amazing honour to be nominated and uh, be involved in, in, in this and be recognised. Uh, sorry I can't be with you today. I'm uh, in uh, London. Um, but thank you very much and uh, it's really an honour. I guess if you can't be in New York, London would be a good second. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. And now for the 2015 Irma Simonton and James H. Black Award winner, Sam and Dave Dig a Hole by Beck Barnett, illustrated by John Clausen, published by Candlewick Press. Two boys and their dog dig in search of something spectacular, but in the end, something spectacular finds them with digital and colored pencil illustrations. Mac Barnett, please come forward to accept the 2015 Irma, Irma S. and James H. Black Award. Oh, thank you so much um, on, on behalf of both John and myself. Congratulations uh, to, to all the honor books, too. They're fabulous books. Um, and, and John and Brian, I've, I've shared a studio for 12 years with you guys. I, I don't know why you never <laughs> mentioned that. You never notice. Brian, my desk is right next to yours. I brought you lunch yesterday. It's hurtful. It's hurtful. Um, John couldn't be here today, and, and uh, he's very sad about that. I'm sure he had something important to do, like photograph dogs for his Twitter. Uh, no, he really tried. John takes a lot of pictures of dogs on his Twitter. It was the background to that joke, for those of you who don't follow John on Twitter. Um, he, he really wanted to be here and couldn't make it, um, but sent some remarks uh, for me to read. So I'm going to start by doing that. I need to get into... <clears throat> My John Clausen mode here. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry if this seems long. I timed it out, and I think it's OK. I don't know if I was supposed to read that part, but it's very John to lead with an apology. So I thought that <laughs> I would read you that note. I'm very sorry I can't be there this morning. That's two apologies. I've written some things down for Mac to read. If you don't like any of what I say, that is probably just the stuff Mac is adding in himself. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes about making this kind of work comes from Annie Albers in an essay she wrote about how she thought the term creativity had gotten away from us a little bit. Annie was a textile weaver at the Bauhaus and a really smart lady. My favorite part of her essay says, being creative is not so much the desire to do something as listening to that which wants to be done the dictation of the materials. Picture books have inherent qualities, and they are particularly suited to certain kinds of stories. Our materials in this case are a cover, a title page, and papers, around 40 pages of drawings and text, an unavoidable gutter down the middle, and whatever trim size seems to suit. Taller trim sizes are more common than wider ones. Bookshelves seem to prefer them. So even before you have a story, you know a few things about your book. 
Often you come up with an idea that is too long for the page count or too wordy for the intended audience or too wide for how tall your book would like to be. But sometimes you read something smart like that Albers essay and it teaches you to try and get ahead of those problems and to listen to what the book wants to do and what it's giving you to, for free before you even start. A tall book is giving you height. A story in a tall book wants to go up or down. Mac and me wanted a tall book and we thought first about going up, but up is just sky and that turned out to be boring. Down ended up being more interesting. From there, all my favorite things about the book can be seen as trying to figure out what the different book ingredients are good at. Pictures and text on the same page are good at contradicting each other. Colored pencils are good at drawing dirt. Dogs are good at coming along for the ride. Cats are good at staying at home. And an audience of kids is very, very good at filling in the blanks should the story leave any behind. Oh, shoot. There was more, I'm sorry. <laughs> I messed that up. I didn't copy the whole thing. Not that there was any ever, any ever doubt, but this book has reminded me over and over again how lucky we are that an audience of kids is the last and most interesting ingredient you know your book is going to have. Their enthusiasm for running with an open-ended idea always knocks me out, and the fact that they liked our book enough to give it this distinction knocks me out even harder. Thank you so much to everyone here who helped them get into the book and into books in general. It means so much to be included in that. I feel so lucky to get to do this and be on a list with the other amazing books that are on it this year and to be working with such a great and talented and almost certainly well-dressed pal as Mac. <laughs> He's probably just talking about the hat. Thank you very much. An applause break right in the middle. That's what we're going to call that part where I messed up. An applause break. <laughs> Um, and as for me, I, I'm, I'm really thrilled and, and moved to be here today getting this award. Um, I, I love this award. I think it has the best looking seal around. Sorry, sorry, Brian. I didn't know, I didn't know about your seal when I wrote that line. Um, and, and also, uh, just to be here on hallowed ground. I mean, not 69 Bank Street, obviously, where, where Lucy Mitchell and Margaret Wise Brown changed children's literature by listening to what kids had to say and, and by observing and hearing kids change the way that they and, and we all write for them. Um, but still, that, that spirit is alive here in this building, in, in the classrooms above us, um, in, in the staff, uh, especially Allie and, and Jenny, who are working so hard to make sure all kids are heard, um, and in the spirit of the Irma and James Black Award. Any piece of art is just a conversation. Uh, it's a conversation between the writer and the reader, and I like to write for kids because I like having conversations with kids. I like talking to kids, but I like it when they, they talk back to me. And I like to write books that they can talk back to, or in this case, uh, scream at sometimes, <laughs> uh, but also talk back to in the way that we all talk back to our books um, by interpreting them. Uh, I travel a lot, and, and lately, every year, I've been doing about 200 or 250, um, I don't know, presentations or shows. Basically, I read to kids um, for about an hour. I'll, I'll read them my picture books, other people's picture books, and, and we talk about literature. And I, I love doing this. It's, I think, um, probably in ways that I'm not even aware of, one of the, the biggest impacts on, on the way that I write. Um, and, and children are different from adults, but they're different in ways that we don't necessarily expect them to be different. They're different in ways that you can only learn by spending a lot of time with kids. And, and when it comes to picture books, kids have been my best editors, my best goads, my best critics. Um, and I don't mean critics in the, in the sense of having criticism, although they, they have those, um, but, but real literary critics, real interpreters. Uh, I think children are children's books smartest critics. And sometimes that can be frustrating, but if you spend a lot of time around kids, it's also revelatory, energizing, and, and for me, it's just straight up inspiring. Um, it's, uh, we wrote this book 
with, with, with kids in mind. And, and when it was coming out, I think there's always anxiety when you're putting uh, a new book out. You're worried about all kinds of things. And I remember John and I were in Chicago having dinner. And uh, we were worried, I think, most about people uh, reading this book, seeing the ending, and, and thinking that this was kind of like a, a, just like a chin-stroking intellectual move or somehow not kid-friendly, which is, I think, a term adults use a lot when they mean not adult-friendly. Um, <laughs> kid-friendly, to me, throws up a warning sign for, for a book that, that adults are having trouble with or, or that doesn't kind of conform to a, a benighted idea of what childhood is. Um, but we knew that our ending could give real pleasure, that, that, uh, that there was pleasure in ambiguity and in mystery and in not knowing, that there, that there was a satisfaction to dissatisfaction. And we've been so heartened that, that our anxieties haven't come true. We, we've just loved the stories that we've heard from libraries and classrooms um, of, of kindergarten teachers showing this to kids, kind of thinking that they, they wouldn't get it, and then having like 10 and 15 minute conversations, which for kindergartners is like a three hour conversation. Um, or, or librarians who, this is what, like our, our favorite thing to happen is, is like when librarians or, or teachers will share the book, um, not knowing that Sam and Dave end up in a different place from where they started. And then a kid will say, that's a different tree. And then this furor erupts and, and everybody's finding the differences and, and, and those stories of adults being surprised by the intelligence, the attentiveness, and, and the skill uh, of their young readers is, is exactly uh, what we hoped for when we made this. I, I've loved sharing this book and talking with kids, hearing their thoughts about where Sam and Dave are at the end. Uh, some people think, they, let's see, Sam's house the underworld, another dimension, the center of the earth. Sam and Dave have died and respawned like in a Minecraft universe. <laughs> the devil's house, the 1990s, <laughs> heaven, which the fans of the real world, those two are the same thing. Uh, then their grandpa's backyard. Um, lots of kids have theories and they'll, they'll work these theories out together. But more than that, uh, more than the answers that they give, it's just great to be in a room with them asking questions. Um, and that's what we're so happy about, that at the end of this book, kids are willing to keep thinking about it and to keep asking questions, like, where did Sam and Dave start? And where did they end up? And what will happen to them next? And these are the big questions. And we're lucky that we have readers brave enough to ask them. So. Um, it's an honor to have this award that belongs to kids because our book belongs to kids too. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. And we so appreciate your, um, your stripes two years in a row. A little Francais, a little nod to Mo Willems from last year. Thank you very much, all of you, for your wonderful comments and insight into how you work. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the podium Kristen Frieda, Director of Library Services, who will tell you a little bit about our participating schools and the process of gathering votes for the Irma Black Award and Cook Prize while I do a small set change. Hi, everybody. Give me a second. I'm going to try to bring up um, the Google map of all the participating schools in the, in the process. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, basically, we had schools from around the country and the world. Um, you can see on this map Alaska and Hawaii, Italy, um, the um, India. So um, each year we get more and more schools involved. And um, we're so proud of that. Um, so I'll read a little and I'll talk a little. I'm just delighted that you're all here to help us honor these talented authors and illustrators who accomplished what they set out to do, win the hearts and minds of the young children. Uh, we've 
This, this particular map is showing the 99 schools um, associated with the Irma Black Award. I did the same thing for the Cook Prize. I shared this map with all the schools so they can all kind of see also where they are. And also they know that this is being filmed and later we'll put this up for the schools. So welcome all of our participating schools. And I definitely want to give a shout out to Wanda Bishop who is here today. Wanda, can you stand up? Wanda is um, our participating school from St. Croix. And uh, every year we invite all the teachers and librarians from these schools to come to our event. And um, they're all working in, also they mostly live, uh, well, a lot of them live in New York, but they're working today, so they don't come. But Wanda came today, so we're so happy. Um, between the Irma Black Award and the Cook Prize, we've received over um, 10,000 votes. Uh, so what really what the children are doing is it's really not a quick vote. They're, they're poring over these books for four to five weeks. They're studying them, they're reading them with their teachers and their librarians in the classroom, and they're really, really thinking about it. And so I think that's why the authors and illustrators that, who accept these awards are so proud. So we are also proud, and we're going to continue to try to grow the, um, the award and, and honor the great creators. So thank you. Um, we're going to look at some Cook Prize books now. Thank you, Kristen. Lucy Spragmitchell loved maps, and she would have loved this one. So it is now my pleasure to bring to the podium two of our distinguished Cook Prize jurors, Lila Mortimer, head teacher in the School for Children with the Sevens Eights and a graduate of the Bank Street Math Leadership Program, and Barbara Dubitsky, a member of the Bank Street graduate faculty specializing in math leadership. Please help me welcome them. Thank you. On behalf of ourselves and the other four Cook Prize jurors, we're delighted to present the Cook Prize Honor Books published in 2014. The first honor book is Behold the Beautiful Dung Beetle by Cheryl Bardot, illustrated by Alan Marks, published by Charles Bridge. Three varieties of dung beetles fight over, devour, and hoard fecal matter and lay their eggs in it in a variety of ways, with dramatic watercolor and pencil illustrations. Alan Marks lives in the UK and could not be with us today, but he did send along some remarks and asked us to read them on his behalf. Here's what he sent. In over 30 years of working in illustration, I reckon I've covered most things, from nursery rhymes to war poems, from blue whales to pink fairy armadillos. I had, in fact, also drawn beetles before but it turns out that there were some areas, some habitats that I had not really considered. A gross subject? On the contrary, dung beetles are jewel-like and utterly engrossing. And my choice of perspective throughout the books is to show that they matter as much or more than the endangered and iconic species of animals on the planet. They are a vital part of the ecosystem, and in short, we'd be in deep doo-doo without them. <laughs> I read recently that in the UK, nonfiction books are endangered too, because of course, now everything can be looked up on the internet. That's terrific, but it's not the same experience as poring over a book. In being truly engaged with words and pictures and has more potential to be random, misguided, incomplete, and erroneous. Happily, I understand that in the United States, nonfiction titles are considered to be more important to children's reading and learning. There are always things I might change in my work, always something I might have done better, but I am delighted with Behold the Beautiful Dung Beetle and with Cheryl Bardot's excellent text. Like all good children's books, it is approachable and complete. It contains an experience of learning through books, and thank you to Bank Street College for promoting this still wonderful idea. Thank you also to Charles Bridge Publishing. Working with you on nonfiction titles, as rigorous as it is, has always been a pleasure not least of all because I get to consider and discover more about the natural world, surely a curiosity that children have too, and something that should only be encouraged. Perhaps having worked on Behold the Beautiful Dung Beetle, I can now begin to say that I really have drawn nature from the top to bottom. <laughs> and now we'd like to bring up Cheryl Bardot, author of Behold the Beautiful Dung Beetle, to accept her Cook Prize honor.
Hello, and uh, thank you for hosting here today. And it is a privilege and a wonderful honor to be a part of this prize and with the other nominees, and also particularly at an organization with this history of appreciating the heart and interests of children, and also how literature serves those interests and really inspires them. So uh, the Dung Beetle book for me started when I was in the car listening to the radio, and there was a scientist who specializes, devotes his life to studying dung beetles, <clears throat> and he was on the radio, and he was talking about many things, but he described them as beautiful. And if you're someone like me, you're always, your ears are out and listening for those kinds of things. And I think to myself, really? How could that be? We've kind of danced all around, but we haven't said the word poop yet. And uh, how could bugs that spend their lives dwelling in and eating poop really truly be beautiful? So I went home and I immediately Googled it and I would encourage anyone here to do that today <laughs> because they are truly beautiful creatures. And that creates a window then to share that with young people and to say with a story, hey, let's look at the world and let's see what there is in the world and how our ways of thinking and our way of life makes us look at something one way, but if we step back and think about it, we can see it completely differently. And what is the role that these insects play in our world? And is there a way in which they're beautiful? And I think Alan Marx's illustrations, he mentioned the perspective, is tremendous. And even if you look at the cover of the book, that is a victorious dung beetle. <laughs> and he's scientifically accurate, and yet, in what we consider the classic human pose of triumph. So thank you very much for this award and for sharing this with teachers and children. Our next Cook Prize honor goes to Mr. Ferris and his Wheel by Katherine Gibbs Davis, illustrated by Gilbert Ford, published by Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt Books for Young, readers. Using the new metal, steel, George Ferris created the sensation of the 1893 World's Fair brought to life through digital mixed media illustrations with ink and watercolor. Um, I was riveted actually by this book. Um, I, I hadn't realized that this was something that people were like scared about. Um, and, um, and that this thing um, got created in a huge rush. They hadn't put the thing together. There it was two months before it was supposed to work, and they hadn't put it together yet. So they were working feverishly. And then on, here's the moment when it's supposed to go, and they had never done it before. They never made this thing turn around before. And there's these 2,000 terrified people watching, and, 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 and Ferris and his wife and these honored guests get into this car. It's like the size of a living room, and it works. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I found it wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, so Gilbert Ford, um, thank you for your book, and please come forward to accept your Cook Prize honor for Mr. Ferris and his wheel. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine wishes she could be here, but she is currently um, giving a presentation to a bunch of first graders in Texas. She extends her gratitude. Um, thank you, Bank Street, for awarding me the Cook Prize honor for Mr. Ferris and his wheel. Um, it is my first nonfiction picture book, and it actually reminded me a lot of doing reports back in grade school. <laughs> Once again, I found myself going to the library, checking out books, researching it, and incorporating it into my drawings. Although um, magic markers and poster board have now been replaced by brushes and computers, the foundation that I received from um, progressive education schools like Bank Street has um, helped me see this book through. Thanks. Our next Cook Prize honor goes to 
<laughs> Mysterious Patterns, Finding Fractals in Nature by Sarah C. Campbell, photos by Sarah C. Campbell and Richard P. Campbell, uh, published by Boyd Mills Press, an imprint of highlights. Having taught on um, children and mostly mathematics for my entire career, it was a great delight to find a book that explains this very complex mathematical ideas of fractals in such a brilliant and elegant way. Um, fra fractals are hard to understand. Uh, and, and here was this just wonderful, wonderful, simple um, way of thinking about them. Um, in the book, Gorgeous Photographs accompany a simple, straightforward explanation of fractals, geometric shapes made up of smaller parts that each look alike. Uh, sorry, that each look like the big shape. So cauliflowers with uh, the cauliflower, big cauliflower, and then the little florets that look just like the cauliflower and even you keep on going down and it keeps on looking like the same thing. Um, Sarah Campbell, please come forward to accept your Cook Prize honor for Mysterious Patterns, Finding Fractals in Nature. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I had people look at me funny when I said I was writing about fractals for elementary school readers. Um, and I understand why. Um, I got this idea from a librarian, actually, um, because I was at a conference talking about growing patterns, which is my previous book about Fibonacci numbers in nature. And he said, you should write about fractals next. And I nodded and smiled. I had no idea what fractals were. Um, but I went home and I looked up fractals. And when the math for um, a very common popular fractal, the Mandelbrot set, looks like this, it could put you off of writing about them for <laughs> elementary readers. Um, Z equals Z squared plus C, where you know every time you uh, get a new value for z, you generate a new value for z, you plug it in and start again. So it's an iterative function. Um, but I, I kept at it and I kept at the research because I, I thought there was something there. And, and I found these two quotes. This is Paul Cezanne. Everything in nature can be viewed in terms of cones, cylinders, and spheres. And then this quote from Benoit Mandelbrot, who, is, who coined the term fractals. Clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, and bark is not smooth, nor does lightning travel in a straight line. So you have an artist who's, who's asking a young artist to view nature in, to see the essence, to, to compare nature to something they know, something you can draw. You can draw a circle or a sphere. But then we have the mathematician, Mandelbrot, who, who is saying, no, look at the roughness, look at the detail, look at what's particular, what's unique about these. But really what opened the door for me to, to write this book was the fact that um, they're really talking about shapes cones, cylinders, and spheres. And so when do we teach kids about those shapes? We don't wait till they get to college to teach them about those shapes. We teach those shapes in elementary school and in early, early learning. And so, you know, here's a spread from the book. Spheres, cylinders, cones. And so the, the way into this book was to start with something that we do know, start with something we're learning, start with something familiar, and then introduce the, the concept of fractals. I had a big boost um, when, in doing the research, um, I came across a course 
offered online by Yale University on fractals. And it was co-written by Mandelbrot and a mathematician named Michael Frame. And I contacted Michael to ask him if he would um, answer some questions for me. And he told me that Mandelbrot, when he died, one thing that he had left unfinished was he had hoped that there would be a book for children about fractals. Because ever since he was young and he was a child, he thought in shapes. And he believed that children, when presented with the idea, could also think and discover in shapes and in the ways that he did. So I am delighted to be here um, among these other honorees. And I appreciate the fact that children voted and discovered um, the concept of fractals and that they, um, they don't find it intimidating at all. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And now we're delighted to present the 2015 Cook Prize winner, Galapagos George, by Jean Craighead George, illustrated by Wendell Minor, published by HarperCollins Children's Books. One million years ago, giant tortoises migrated to the Galapagos Islands and slowly evolved into different subspecies of tortoises, illustrated with realistic watercolor paintings. Wendell Miner and Twig George, on behalf of your mother, please come forward to accept these awards for the 2015 Cook Prize winning book, Galapagos George. Good morning. Um, I'm so proud to be here. Um, and accept this award for my mother, Jean Craighead George, who in her lifetime, I think, wrote over 120 books for kids. And in a sense, it was a force of nature herself. Growing up with her um, was quite an adventure. She brought the animals that she wrote about into the house, like into the house. So we had crows knocking on the window in the morning to come in and have breakfast. and owls sitting on your shoulder in the shower and she would take all these experiences and work them into stories and bring kids in to nature and make them feel not only she, she wanted to educate she wanted to give them the information she believed in information she would also often say people keep saying I should take information out no I'm putting more in and she would go back and she would put more in and she says kids want information but she also would put them there I mean she would put their feet on the sand and their toes in the mud and they could feel um, what it was like to be there and she had a sense of story, so she could take the facts and she could weave them through the story and make it an emotional experience and tie you to it as well as giving you the facts. And with Galapagos George, I think it was a very special book. Uh, she went to the Galapagos when she was 80, about 15 years ago, and um, with her amazing um, optimism she you know she was working on books uh, until four days before she passed away and so she wrote the book Galapagos George and through the the way publishing works it really um, didn't get through the publishing process until um, she passed away which was kind of a poignant moment because Galapagos George is about a tortoise that lives in the Galapagos Islands that was 100 years old when it died. It, that century was almost the same century my mother lived when she was 92 when she passed away. Um, Galapagos, Galapagos George um, also stood for, uh, he was a symbol of endangered species. He was the last of his kind. And I think, she 
identified with that because she was also um, very much connected with, uh, you know, teaching children about endangered species, about the, the world, about wildlife. And to have them go at the same moment was very, very, um, it was very tough. And um, I'm just so glad that the kids and the teachers out there voted for this book. I, you know, leave it to Bank Street to create awards where the kids really get to do the work of choosing their literature. And I have seen kids in action um, working on these books, and they take it very seriously. And they read, and they reread, and how wonderful is it to have them reread the books. They, they talk about the art, they talk about the words, they talk about how they go together, they get the big concepts. Even one day, one day we ended up talking about Aristotle as a result of the, you know, uh, you know, one of the picture books, and these were second graders. So they, um, they rise to the challenge, and I think the, the wards themselves recognize how much kids have to offer in evaluating their own um, uh, literature. So uh, the book was done with Wendell Miner, who illustrated 25 of mom's books, 22. Um, they work together. I used to uh, go home and see them at um, the table at dinner and they'd be talking about a subject and you know maybe something would come up and you know they'd leave and a week later mom had a draft of a, of a book and said, here Wendell. <laughs> and meanwhile he had a few other things to catch up to. But they were a great pair and I will now turn it over to Wendell. Twig is one of Bank Street's own, by the way, just in case you didn't know that. But I'd like to thank the committee, uh, Bank Street, and it's an honor to be included in such a prestigious group of books. Um, I worked with Jean for uh, about 20 years. Um, working with Jean is like working with a living, she was a living legend. She goes back to Ursula Nordstrom days when she presented, I think it Twig's behest, an idea about wolves that she was writing for Reader's Digest and she couldn't get home in time to finish the article or it was canceled and she told Ursula about this wonderful girl idea she had and we're talking with the wolves and Ursula said, here's a contract, go do it. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way anymore. Um, but I thought I'd put this in context since I've been around a long time and uh, Jean and I loved working together. And this is Earth Day, April 22nd, 1990. And this is in Jean's own words. I, went, I met Wendell at the American Library Association meeting in the United Nations Ballroom. We talked of nature artists, mountains, birds, and the mystic Everglades. We found that great march was a mutual love. He loved them, I loved them. And so our first book was born and conceived on that marble floor in that great building. I spent parts of the last 10 years canoeing from hammock to hammock in the Everglades with my naturalist father. The book came easily. Wendell renewed his feelings about it by going to the Everglades, painting the sawgrass, birds, and alligators. His work was beautiful and more importantly, accurate. When, we opened the, when I opened the finished book, we had something special. That day we decided to work together to bring realism and joy to nature to all of our young audiences. As often as we could, we traveled the to the environment in which we were studying. There was, uh, Wendell took photographs, made sketches, felt the spirit of habitat. We talked, we walked the frozen sea ice in the Arctic for our book, Arctic Sun. We next climbed cliffs and rafted rivers in Wyoming for our adventure series, Cliffhanger, Firestorm, and Snowboard Twist. We always talked to experts to make sure that we had done the right details correctly. For instance, the, same, the correct bird on the right blade of grass in a Wyoming valley, or the correct wing spread of the great horned owl in the eastern hardwood forest. Uh, when we worked on Galapagos, George, <coughs> I unfortunately couldn't get there. Uh, when Gene went, it was 
quite an expensive trip. But I had a lot of friends who'd been there. Uh, we talked to the head of the Darwin Research Center, and of course I did l tons and tons of research. I have a lot of photographer friends who, who had photographed George, and as a matter of fact, George is now over at the Natural History Museum on display if you would like to see him. Um, but I want to thank Catherine Teagan, uh, uh, who put us together. Catherine is now a, a force of nature in her own right. I'd also like to thank Dana Fritz, the in-house designer who I work with carefully. But Dean and I would always conceive ideas together. And I remember when we, we finished the Everglades book, um, she said, okay, now we're going to a cold place. So we went to the Arctic. And we were right in the middle of the frozen Arctic Ocean and uh, I got my first dog sled team ride. Uh, I, I, I rode on the snow machine. She said, you've ever been on one? I said, no, but let me try. And we had a great time. Well, Jean passed away three years ago tomorrow. And it's a very sad day. Um, but on February 18th, 2012, I sent her the scan of the first finished painting of Galapagos, George, and here's what she responded only a few minutes later. Perfect. The little bird puts him in scale. As we kids say, awesome. <laughs> Love Jean. Um, Jean was... I think in, in, the, in the same stratosphere as John Burroughs and John Muir and Rachel Carson, I think what she has done uh, in her 64-year career as a writer is remarkable. And I think to honor these books that honor science, technology, uh, are important because I think to bring this stuff to kids, I'm a dyslexic. And anything I wanted to read as a kid, I had to struggle through. And if, it was, if I was going to struggle, I was going to read nonfiction. And I had this desire to learn everything. Dyslexics, as you know, are like, a, their minds are like pinball machines. They function in three dimensions and go every different direction. My interests have always been science, nature, history, biology. Anything to do with that, I've done a book on it. And every time I do a book, I learn something new. And I have a stack of manuscripts at home from Jean, from conversations that took place at a dinner table. Two days later, the manuscript shows up, and they're yet to be done. The last book that, we're, that I'm on schedule with, with Catherine, is a picture book version of Crowbar the Crow, which is a story unto itself. But it's all about the intelligence of that incredible species of birds. But I want to thank all of you. Um, it's an honor to have worked with a legend, and uh, it isn't over yet. Her legacy continues, and it's a timeless message for all of us that the wonders of nature are yet to be discovered and to continue to be discovered by the next generation. Thank you very much. Oh, it was wonderful to relive Jean, Jean Craighead George for those few moments. Thank you, Twig and Wendell. I want to congratulate all of our finalists. Could I ask everyone to remain seated while our authors and artists make their way to the autographing area in the lobby? Let's give them another round of applause for their wonderful books. I'd like to thank Julie Gribble and the Kidlit TV team for making this live stream event possible. And don't forget to relive the whole thing on their website, kidlittv.com. The information is outside in the lobby. Um, I'd also like to thank School Library Journal for publicizing our voting process and helping us recruit our new schools and to our finalists. I'd like to thank Nicholas Gray, our photographer, and John Bellacosa, who brings the beautiful aesthetics to our programs and to the awards themselves. I'd like to thank the members of the Bank Street Children's Book Committee. Would you stand, Children's Book Committee members who are here? Please stand and be recognized. They do an amazing amount of reading and work and discussion to get us to our finalists. I'd also like to thank the Irma Black Award and Cook Prize jurors who narrowed down the pool to the semifinalists on which the children vote. I'd like to thank Allie Bruce, our children's librarian, and the teachers and students in the School for Children who make these awards happen. 
and the thousands of children around the world who voted on today's honorees. Thank you to all of our team in the library who do so much to support the Irma Black Award and the Cook Prize, especially Lindsay Wyckoff. And thank you, Kristen Frieda, Director of Library Services, for administering the awards and keeping all of our participating schools on track and on time with their voting process and for supporting all of our work at the Center for Children's Literature. Thank you all for coming today.